If Reality Check Radio enriches your day and life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Graham Davis is like me, a Kaiviti. That's Fijian for Born in Fiji. He's an award-winning Fijian investigative journalist who is concerned about all sorts of shenanigans going on with the new government in Fiji, among which is a rollicking sex scandal involving two cabinet ministers. He joins me on the line now from Sydney to discuss developments. Welcome back to The Crunch, Graham Davis, Fijian journalist, currently residing in Australia, uh, but you're like me, a Kaiviti, and you've got a, a, a huge interest in what's going on in our homeland. Yes, quite right, Cam. Uh, thank you for having me on the show again. Um, yes, and uh, very interesting times in our, in our uh, country of birth, our homeland, so to speak. Um, let me lead you into it. This is quite a complicated story, and particularly for a foreign audience to sort of understand, you know, the full scope of the horror of this. But let me just ask you, you, Cam Slater, to imagine this. A New Zealand cabinet minister who is married, a woman, goes on an overseas trip. Yep. It is, it is a parliamentary delegation, and another cabinet minister, a man, brings his wife with him, along with him, on this, on this parliamentary delegation. When they're away, the woman cabinet minister entices the man to her hotel room and they have sex while his wife sleeps in an adjoining room. Text messages between the two are leaked, referring to them having brutal sex, so much so that she complains she can't walk the day, la- the day afterwards. Yeah. She also says in these texts that she's high on weed, marijuana, and drunk on Jack Daniels whiskey. They eventually go home and the Prime Minister hears about their antics. He calls them in and asks them if it's true, and they lie. He then misleads the nation by issuing a formal statement saying that he asked them whether it was true, and they deny it. And he asked the public to stop spreading rumours about what's going on. Yeah. Then five months later, the leaked texts emerge and prove that the whole thing is true. Now, let me ask you this, Cam. What would happen under those circumstances in New Zealand? Well, you know, you lie to a prime minister um, when you're confronted and, and you tell a, an orchestra, well, there's a lexicon in New Zealand, it's called an orchestrated litany of lies. It came from the Mann inquiry into the Erebus crash of Air New Zealand. And uh, Justice Mann said that t- Air New Zealand's evidence was an orchestrated litany of lies. So that would probably come out. The media would probably say, well, they've lied to the prime minister. Lying to a prime minister is instant sacking. Uh, forget all the details. The lying is what gets them in trouble and they would be gone. Of course, there's all the lurid sex details. Uh, of course, there's the question of how the minister actually got hold of cannabis uh, did she well, bring precisely. it into the con- did she bring it into the country that foreign country herself in breach of any number of uh, anti-narcotics um laws uh, you know did they subvert the the diplomatic pouch process um yeah. all of those sorts of things just raises a whole lot of questions so in well, New Zealand in, 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 yeah. in New Zealand if you did this yeah. one or both of the ministers would be summarily dismissed from their portfolios to sit on the back bench if not, uh, thrown out of um, Parliament entirely because of the the embarrassment. Of course, there would be normal party processes that would kick in where yeah. you would perhaps have a, an investigation by a party, uh, a disciplinary committee, um, findings of disrepute, all of those sorts of things. They could even be chucked out of a party eventually. And we actually saw this in New Zealand with a, a bit of a sex scandal with actually a mate of mine, Jamie Lee Ross, who was accused of, ironically, brutal sex. Well, he was right. gone. He was out. See you it's later. Infectious. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> this thing's catching. Well, listen, let me tell you what happened in Fiji, right? Yeah. The ruling party, the PAP, the People's Alliance, part of the coalition of three parties, set up a, dis- a disciplinary committee hearing, including two lawyers. It has found the allegations proven Yet 11 days after he received the report, the Prime Minister, Siti Veni Rambuka, still can't decide whether to sack the female minister. 
he he had uh, already uh, expelled the male minister from the cabinet, but for an entirely separate reason, for insubordination. So, well, uh, so we now situation. have, and and the most important thing, well, one of the most important things to understand here is that this woman, Linda Tambuya, is the minister for women and children and social protection in the in the Fijian government, and she remains in place as we speak, having having had a disciplinary hearing of her own party, find the allegations against her proven. It then went to the executive committee of the People's Alliance, uh, um, and and they, on the basis of the disciplinary committee's report, stripped her her of the title uh, of deputy leader of the party. So she's out for, as deputy leader, but the prime minister, Sidi Beni Rambuka, can't bring himself to do the logical next thing, which is to remove her as a, as as the minister for women and children. So that's the astonishing situation in Fiji as we speak, and in a parliamentary week in which really this has not become an issue in the parliament at all. We're into day two of the session, um, and it's just the most astonishing thing. And I, I'm sure we'll be canvassing a lot of the detail as, as we go ahead. But um, but it, but there you have it. Well, this is an interesting situation uh, which involves you, of course, where Linda Tambuya has said one thing to the Fijian public, that this is fake news, that there's AI being used to generate these images, although I'm not sure how the AI managed to get an well, exact just, duplicate exactly. of, the, of the turtle tattoos that are on her back. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but, but she, stopped, she has actually stopped denying uh, the veracity of all of this, Cam, in, in recent days, because the disciplinary committee of her own party has found her guilty. Yeah. So yeah. she's got a bit of a problem. As you know, um, she reported me to Australia's e-safety commissioner because I published in a censored form uh, some of the leaked images of her that included uh, what you've just mentioned, the, the tattoos on her back of turtles. Now, the importance of that is that she comes from Kandavu, the southern island in Fiji, where they, where, where they do the calling of the turtles. Yeah. Yeah. So that explains why there's turtles on her back. Now, um, you, you know, I've had sort of uh, wags say to me, call on her to show us her tats, which would have established the veracity of these photographs once and for all. Of course, um, you know, th this was ignored. But the disciplinary committee spent two weeks or so forensically going through the evidence against her. Which, which, by the way, included correspondence to me by the e-safety commissioner in Australia saying, not that the images that I had used or published were fake, but that I didn't have her consent to use them. Mm. Now, this was a very powerful piece of hard evidence that uh, when she went to the e-safety commissioner to make a complaint about me, it wasn't to say he, you know, look, look, he's 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 publishing these these images of me that are false. Um, it's, it's, it, she went to them saying, I haven't given my consent uh, to, for him to use these. And Australia has very, very sort of tough um, online safety laws, and I fell foul of that. Now, I, on, on pain of $156,000 in fines, I removed the offending images, and I was happy to do so because that's the law. But, but essentially, you know, these are laws that are designed to sort of, uh, you know, to sort of curb uh, or prevent revenge porn, you know, yeah. people putting up pictures of their former spouses or girlfriends or whatever. And, of course, you know, in my case, uh, or in relation to what I was publishing on my... It was on news. My, it was news, yeah. It was, it was in the public interest that people understood exactly what all this was. So, I, But in any way, nonetheless, I got caught up in in this Australian dragnet and, um, and those pictures, uh, uh, you know, I've had to obviously delete. At the same time, she complained to Facebook um, about me and I got uh, uh, kicked off Facebook altogether. I had more than 30,000 followers from my grub sheet uh, Facebook page. She complained to Meta, the owners of Facebook, and I was kicked off. So... Fortunately, I had a, a you know my website, which 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 I'd sort of deactivated to some extent because 
you know, there's more than half a million Facebook accounts in Fiji. So that that was the no, way so, to get so the mass audience. Yeah, it's how everything's communicated and Fiji is using Facebook. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, I'm I mean, off Facebook now. I'm gone. Now, now you know, and this, this person has actually done me quite a bit of damage, but, of course, it's come back uh, – it's rebounded on her because the allegations that that I had made, which were first made by a guy called Victor Lyle, who's a journalist and an academic at Oxford University in Britain, mm. have been found to have been true uh, by the ruling party's disciplinary committee. And, of course, you know, there's a certain irony about this, and it speaks volumes for the Fijian media, and I guess the Pacific media generally, that it took a guy who lives 16,000 kilometres away from Fiji in Oxford, England, to break the story, and little old me sitting in Sydney, you know, doing what I do, but because the mainstream media in Fiji completely ignored this story and told the People's Alliance a Disciplinary Committee established no, they that were it was running, proven. They, yeah. they, were, they were running the lines that this was AI. Um, well, they were, in fact, yes, they were, were running the lines, line that this was fake and generated by AI, which was Linda Tambuya's version of, of what had happened. Yeah. But worse than that, they were actually manipulating the news. The Fiji Times, which is the you know, traditional newspaper of record in Fiji since 1869, was running the line that I had sort of falsely sort of put up these images and, and particularly honing in on one image in particular that, 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 that they reported was old and and made a big song and dance about how I'd been reported by Linda Tambuya to the Fiji police. Now, the mm. Fiji police have conducted an investigation into me. That's my understanding. But, of course, now that, uh, now that the allegations have been proven, I mean, Linda Tambuya is obviously uh, exposed to the prospect of, uh, you know, prosecution for wasting police time. So it's going to be interesting to see to see what happens. But of course, we're all just waiting to see what the Prime Minister, City of Rambuka, is going to do. Now he seems to be totally and utterly in a state of seizure, indecision. You know, he just doesn't know. He doesn't seem to know what to do now, which has led to all sorts of speculation. In the bunker, Linda Tim, in the bunker, well, Linda Tim, in the bunker maybe, metaphorically, yeah, yeah, but she may be blackmailing him, yeah, because there was a, a very senior person in the government told me, or, or a person close to the top of the government told me uh, a few days ago that she and her lover boy Asaria and Drawn Draw were planning a motion of no confidence in the parliament, which would bring down the government and hand and hand power back to the Fiji, the former Fiji First government. You know, this is this yeah. is the Bi Frank Bainimarama and I as Said Kayum's party. Now, whether or not that's true, we, we you know, we haven't, you know, obviously we can't establish, but something is preventing Sidaveni Rambuka from making the hard decision to sack her as a minister, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I could, it, play, I could play devil's advocate here a little bit, Graham, and say, Look, um, he's got a one-seat majority. Um, if uh, he's already got that sort of kind of disappeared, with one minister being sacked, who would you know could uh, withdraw the vote from the whip if he decided to do that. If he sacks a second minister, then he really is at risk of the government collapsing, uh, which would then create a constitutional crisis because there isn't enough support there. Uh, for Fiji First to form a government unless the Bim and Prasad party uh, actually swaps around and goes goes with Fiji First. But that would be uh, a terrible dilemma for the Prime Minister to sit there contemplating the end of his government barely a year after it's been elected. Well, yes, it's, it's 14 months uh, mm. uh, that he's been in power. Well, 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 doubtless that's foremost in his mind, you know, the risk to the government as a whole, and I can understand that. But then he also has to wear the scenario that I outlined at the start of the program uh, interview that, that sort of, you know, that essentially the, go the government's moral compass is pointing somewhere in the direction of the South Pole, yeah, uh, downwards, and that, uh, you know, that, that sort of it doesn't matter that, uh, uh, you know, that, that this stuff has happened. I mean, he, he, he told the weekend media in Fiji that he was going to make his decision based on the ministerial code of conduct. Well, it's leading people to say, well, has the, has the ministerial code of conduct being, re, be, being rewritten to, to, to allow sort of 
illicit sex and drug use on overseas trips. And I don't think we've actually said uh, yet because I was, it was all in the realms of sort of, you know, hypothetical when we were talking at the start of the, of the interview. But all of this took place in room 233 of the Windsor Hotel in Melbourne, you know, the venerable yep. and very stately Windsor Hotel in Melbourne, during a parliamentary delegation visit uh, to, uh, at the invitation of the Victorian Parliament, back in August last year. So, you know, I don't know what's in the water in Melbourne, but yes, and, and, and you've raised a very important point. How did Linda Tambuya get access to weed, which is what she was calling it, marijuana, in Melbourne, you know, did she yeah. acquire it locally? Did she take it in there? Because at the start of all of this, there were reports unconfirmed that, you know, she had said to somebody or he had said to somebody, haven't you heard of the of the diplomatic, diplomatic bag? Well, well, that raises all sorts of extremely grave questions about the integrity of the uh, of security systems and, and, and diplomatic misbehaviour and all sorts of things. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but it's also real- look. I, I I just find the whole thing so flabbergasting. You know, I've been a journalist for sort of half a century. Uh, you know, last year, and I'm just gobsmacked by the whole damn thing. Well, that's the, that's you, the thing, though, isn't it, Graham? Is that <laughs> is that is that the the slur that Linda Tambuya has put on you uh, is the same slur that uh, Frank Bainey Marima and uh, and the former Attorney General. Um, would would say that you were just a, a blogger uh, sitting yeah. in uh, sitting in your shorts in Sydney making stuff up, but you're not yeah. a blogger, are you? I mean, I I've even had that allegation put to me by someone who's very close to Ram Booker, to the yeah. current prime minister. Said, oh, I what a, you know, I need to talk to you about what this blogger in Sydney is doing. I said, do you mean Graham Davis? And he yeah. said, yes, yes, that's his name. I said, he's no blogger. Uh, he's an no, award, well, look, award-winning oh, no, yeah. journalist and a Fiji, yeah. born in Fiji, a Fijian citizen, um, yeah. and he is very concerned about the country of his birth, as am I. And to, yeah. you can't you can't call me a blogger either. I'm a, a recognised journalist that's won awards, not as prestigious as your awards, but awards nonetheless. Well, look, uh, you know, that's I mean, a just, smear just so, that they put on you yeah. um, to try and dismiss the seriousness of the allegations that's something you and perhaps Victor Lyle have made up, but you haven't made it up. It's, no, we haven't got the documents, you've haven't. got the copies of everything, um, and it's and it's news. And yeah. it, it almost Well, here's seems- the irony. I mean, here's the irony, Cam. I first got fed the images, you know, the turtle, yeah. the, the, the titties, the whole thing, last October, and I was on good terms with Linda Tambuya back then. So I, yeah. I wrote to her saying, look, I have been sent images of you that clearly must be artificial, yeah? Yeah. And, and just letting you know that this has happened. And I feel very sorry because this is a very, this is very inappropriate and, these, and, and let's hope these misogynists get their comeuppance. And I thought at the time it was very odd that she sent me just back, uh, sent me back a one-line message saying, you know, thank you for your blessing, Graham. No indignation or claim then that the images no, were fake. Oh yes, it's outrageous. And I thought that was terrible. That, and, yeah, exactly. None of that. Because she knew that so was thought, real. Yeah, exactly. And and of course I, you know, I, I I sort of find that quite quite astonishing, really. I mean, we do have a history in that in that, in that before the last election, she asked me to be her personal PR advisor. Because I had been, you know, for six years uh, under the Barney Marama government, the, you know, the, gov- the, the Barney yeah. Marama government's principal comms advisor. And, and so, so she wanted me to, to work for her with a view, an explicit view, to becoming, eventually becoming prime minister. Yeah. So she is seeing the prize of the prime ministership, which she craves, and she had been really uh, one of the two front runners to succeed uh, City of Anirum Booker, the other being a guy called Manoa Kamikamitha. She's seeing all of that sort of evaporate before her eyes. So she's fighting like an alley cat to, to keep her job um, quite clearly. Yeah, but I'm the problem for her is that public opinion has turned on her. 
you know, the, well, the social thing, well, media has Once turned, the truth yeah. gets out there, public opinion changes. But it kind of reminds me, I mean, looking at the Fiji media and their missing in action, uh, their behaviour suggests that this is a case, you know, like the famous paraphrased quote that news is what somebody does not want you to print and all the rest is advertising. And this, yep. this, this is a classic case of that. We've got some news here that in Australia or New Zealand or Canada or the UK, indeed in the United States, would cost a minister or a, or a senior government official their job. Yeah. And all you've got really is, you know, the traditional Fijian whispering, the, the coconut wireless, as it's affectionately called, spreading information faster than the news media can because they're not even trying to spread information. Well, they're that's it. They're trying to suppress yeah, information. That, uh, and the other thing, as you know, there's all these very complex fa familiar, you know, family relationships in Fiji. Oh, yes. You know, a, a lot of people are related to each other, you know, and, and you, you find this all the time. And, of course, there's a huge and massive complex web of uh, of relationships uh, of the you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, buddy. So in the case of the Fiji Times, the oldest newspaper in Fiji, it has been demonstrably supportive of Linda Tambuya in that it's completely ignored the story or twisted it. And even now, when the disciplinary committee has found against her, is giving it very half-hearted coverage. Whereas to its credit, the Fiji Sun, which was always accused of being rabidly pro Frank Bainimarama during the Fiji first years, has started to take up the cudgels and, and sort of do its job as the watchdog. And in fact, for the second time in a week today, the Fiji Sun has an editorial calling on the Prime Minister to finally make a decision in relation to Linda Tsimbuya's, um, you know, hold over the Ministry of Women and Children. But of course, let, you know, it, it said last week that she was a straight-faced liar and called for her mm -hmm. removal, and the mm -hmm. Prime Minister did nothing about that. Now, this is a the difference between the difference between the mainstream media and especially the two newspapers in Sydney and Victor Lal and me offshore is kind of you know with our websites is that of course you know their traditional newspapers uh, which are passed from person to person so that the circulation figures of those papers don't re don't reflect the actual readership because as soon as somebody stops reading the paper it's handed to the next person so it's extremely critical that the mainstream media in countries like Fiji do their jobs properly and the irony of all of this is that the new government came came into power in December 2022 promising to, well, they did. They lifted the what was always called the draconian media laws of the previous government. And, this, and th there is total media freedom in Fiji, ostensibly. But total media freedom in Fiji has been replaced by this appalling self-censorship. Or, you know, uh, I mean, m m many well, I've, suspect. I've, I've seen it in person because you know, in the tw 2014 election, I came up to cover that. Yeah. And I went to a few of the meetings, particularly at the Fiji Elections Office, where there would be about 20 journalists there, uh, mostly locals, and they'd open it up for questioning and there would be a stony silence. Nobody I know. would, would I say know. anything. And it was up to me to ask some difficult questions, of which, of course, I got um, you know, scowly looks from yeah, Mohamed Salim. House, but, how surprising that Cam Slater would ask a difficult question. You know, and, and I got scowly looks, you know, from, from Mohamed Salim, and he um, decided that I was going to be the enemy from then on. Yeah, um, this is the former supervisor of elections who's now before the courts. Yes, on corruption charges. Char on corruption <laughs> charges, yeah. But, well, um, Cam, but, Cam but, you've also been instrumental in this particular saga yes. because you, you gave it fresh life, um, you know, the allegations against Linda Tambuya and Aseri and Rondra by, by reporting it yourself. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the Fijian diaspora in New Zealand is significant. And, of course, uh, there was quite a lot of comment on my own website from people in the comment section saying, wow, Cam Slater's onto it. Well, they're not going to get away with this now because Cam Slater's onto it. Yeah, he's totally fearless and all of that. So yeah, well, so, you know, so we, it has we, played a part. Well, he did force the hand of Radio New Zealand because they've run two stories about this. The first one, which was you could, you know, generously say it was sympathetic to Linda Tamboya's position. Then I ran an article which revealed, you know, re referencing their article, 
uh, which revealed far more detail. And then all of a sudden, in the second article that Radio New Zealand ran, they were now asking you for comment and uh, rebalancing the, the, the equation. Well, uh, the critical thing, the critical thing was that the disciplinary committee of the ruling party reported, and they reported that the allegations against her had been proven, yeah, or that they had found the allegations mm-hmm. against her proven. Of course, that transformed the attitude of the international media, which had been very sceptical about uh, the claims that Victor Lyle and I were making. And, and of course, it, it, it's completely changed everything. But, but you know the old saying, truth will out, and it was never going to it was never going to be viable for them to keep a lid on such a blatant exercise in misconduct. Yeah. And I mean, on foreign soil in a luxury hotel in room 233, where Victor Lyle was able to establish that the photographs of the carpet in the leaked messages matched exactly the carpets in the Windsor Hotel. Yeah. And, you know, hotel staff confirming that she was in that particular mm-hmm. room. It was always going to come out. And, it, it, you know, to some extent, it's a lesson uh, for the locals, which has already been learnt in New Zealand. You know, I mean, I've been a comms advisor for a big American crowd. And, uh, and you know, you fess up. You don't try to cover up because in the end it's going to come out and, it, and it's going to get a lot worse, which the, it has. Yeah, well, it has got worse. And whilst lurid sexual uh, indiscretions are, are grist to the mill for most media, Mm. Um, this government in Fiji is beset by a plethora of issues and scandals, and we covered that somewhat in, in our last discussion that we had, yeah. particularly around the illegal appointment of some senior government officials. Yeah, um, there, there's a, there, 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 through the courts in Fiji, and and systematically the government is losing the cases. Well, um, no, it's not. Tra- it's not. That's the that's the whole point. It's not tra- trundling through the courts. They're going to refer it to the Supreme Court, but there's been no sort of timetable for doing that. Well, so that we have, we have, we have, you know. yeah, we have an acting DPP who's illegally appointed because the Constitution bars anyone having been found guilty of professional misconduct from holding the job. We have a judge in the Court of Appeal who is illegally appointed because he too has been found guilty of professional misconduct. And the government takes absolutely no notice of it. You well, know, what about the Attorney General? Is there any questions over his appointment? Well, not so much his appointment, but but he is now embroiled in a scandal, which has just really broken in the last 48 hours or so, and that is that he's being accused of, of fraud and false pretenses uh, in relation to a case that he handled when he was in private practice before he became Attorney General in which somebody is claiming that uh, that he mishandled a divorce and the effect of that has been that there's been an act of bigamy conducted in which somebody who's already married has married somebody else in the United States. Now, the Fiji police are investigating that. And of course, we all know how the police uh, prosecution services uh, and the uh, you know the government's prosecution service works. The police will give a docket to the illegal acting director of public prosecutions, who has been appointed by the attorney general, who will then make a decision on the likelihood of the charges sticking and whether it's in the public interest in relation to the very person who has appointed him to the job. So, what do you think is going to happen there? You know. It's just this sort of web of interrelated uh, parties scratching each exactly. other's back, which, exactly. lead, which leads to the perception that what we're looking at, well, you know, it, it's a saying that's used and everyone thinks it's derogatory, but when you look at what's going on, you have to say that a banana republic is exactly the situation we're looking at here. Well, look, it's it's worse than that because a lot of Fijians just have this t- terrible sense of betrayal that they'd had enough of the Bainimarama regime for the 16 years, you know, yeah. so part of that a dictatorship, part of it a democracy. And in the first years of Bainimarama's rule, a lot of optimism about the country, you know, yeah. uh, him having levelled the playing field. Well, you and, and me both. We, we, both yeah. we both thought there was some optimism. The Fiji was growing. We were seeing development happening. We were yeah. seeing roads being repaired. You were seeing kids going to school. 
um, the schooling becoming well, free. Well, the first free education know. in the country's history was provided by yeah. Frank Bynum. There was a, yeah. a lot of positive things that you and I both thought was a refreshing change from the coup culture, uh, yeah. albeit having been done by someone who had conducted a coup. But it was a coup for the right reasons, and then somehow they just lost their way. And we well, ended up know, back in the way, into in the, the endemic and systemic um, corruption issues that is plaguing Fijian politics and Fijian society. Well, in the way of these things, Cam, and it happens in sort of fully-fledged democracies like New Zealand and Australia, you know, political parties get into power, they're there for too long, they get used to being there, they don't want to surrender the reins of power. So so they start doing things which are anti-democratic. That's what happened with Fiji first. People were ready for a change. Rambuka, Sidney Benny Rambuka, who, as you know, was the architect, well, he carried out the coups of 1987, which started the whole coup cycles in Fiji. Mm. But he protested that the leopard had changed its spots. Yeah, he did. He, he went around and, and, yeah. and humbled himself before various communities, was saying the right things. And, you know, you have to kind of accept a redemption story. You have to accept that somebody has reformed and changed and the leopards changed their spots. But he hasn't really, has he? No, he hasn't. And in fact, one of the worst facets of the new government is that they are so overtly racist. I mean, people get upset when I say there's workplace ethnic cleansing taking place, mm. but there's no other word to describe a situation in which Indo-Fijians, you know, the minority and other races are being systematically purged and replaced by HRK. And that includes white people. I mean, there's a woman called Elizabeth Rice who was the Assistant Director of Public Prosecutions, who's British but has family ties to New Zealand, who, who was sacked by the illegal acting DPP and was told that it was because she was white and that he wanted an ETRK to replace her. I mean, she's suing the state for unfair dismissal on racial grounds. Yeah, um, But, you know, this is the absolute pits, really, that the racism that pervaded Fiji or took Fiji by the throat in 1987 when Rumbuka staged his coups to establish the supremacy of the ETRK has reared its ugly head again, you know, three decades later, spearheaded by the same guy, yeah? Well, so, what's interesting, uh, Graham, is that as the last uh, discussion we had, was shared widely in Fiji, and I received uh, heaps of comments and emails from people saying, thank you, Cam, for standing up for a minority in Fiji, the European Fijians, of which you and I are both, but we're Fijians nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, uh, and people like us are marginalised on a daily basis, <laughs> and it's accepted because, well, you know, it's okay when racism is from brown people towards white people, it seems. And they well, feel I'm voiceless a, yes, and say, powerless. I mean, this is a, you know, I mean, I, I've also been criticised for calling this the new white man's burden, that tens of thousands of ETRK are living in Australia and New Zealand and, you know, benefiting from social security and all those kind of things, sending money back to their families. Yep. There's no discussion in Australia and New Zealand along the lines that is occurring in Fiji, that these people are what the Itake call vulangi, which mm. means visitors, yeah? yeah? We don't say, oh, you're merely a visitor in Australia and New Zealand and, and you don't really belong. You know, you need to go back to where you came from. Oh, we're getting that in New Zealand now. We're getting particularly militant activist Maori that are you know talking about settler mentality, colonial mentality, visitor mentality. We're getting that in New Zealand now, okay. but, but well, that, obvi well, obviously Europeans are a majority in New Zealand as they are in Australia. In, yeah. Fi in Fiji, it, it, Europeans are a minority, but but you and I are not Vulangi, right? We're no, well, I don't regard myself as Vulangi. If I'm born in Fiji and I'm a Fijian national or yeah. citizen of Fiji with a Fiji passport and all that kind of thing, I should have the right to belong in the same way as when they come to Australia – and, and, you know, ostensibly New Zealand, they have a right to belong. Nobody in Australia says, you it's know. It's a birthright. It's where you were born. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's you just know? appalling. And this racism that has crept into the place has you know, all sorts of implications long term 
for social and economic stability. Because what's happening, Cam, and it's it's to be expected, is that a lot of people from the minorities, and particularly Indo-Fijians, have decided that they've given up on Fiji. Mm. And there's a mass exodus out of the country. I mean, after 1987, mm. when Rambuka did coups, tens of thousands of the country's best and brightest just fled. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, for Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Canada, you, um, uh, Britain, anywhere who would, which would take them. The same thing is happening again. And of course, it's exacerbated by the labor shortages in Australia and New Zealand and other countries, where these people, for the first time in their lives, can get reasonably easy access to countries like Australia and New Zealand. And of course, you know, they're offered salaries that the average Fijian can only dream of. So we had official statistics not so long ago that 50,000 people had left Fiji in two years. Yeah. yeah out of now, a population now, of under a million. It's a lot. That's right. That's right. Well, in fact, and then somebody very senior in the government let it be known that the actual figure was 80,000 over the, that two-year period. Wow. And it had got to the stage recently where 13,000 had left in a single month alone. So this is causing suddenly, you know, belatedly, a lot of concern in Fiji because suddenly they're realising that they're losing their teachers, they're losing their doctors, they're losing their nurses, they're losing their plumbers, they're losing their carpenters. They're losing their electricians. Anybody whose skills are in demand in Australia is taking a one-way ticket and walking out the door. I guess on the positive side, if you can call it that, is that the remittance industry is getting bigger. And that, that and for, for listeners in New Zealand, the remittance is what Fijian citizens do when they are earning big bucks in New Zealand or Australia or anywhere else in the world is they send a large and significant part of their income back to Fiji as a remittance. And it's actually, well, it's, well, it's actually it's almost a, as big as tourism. Well, it is. It's the second biggest industry after tourism. Yeah. A billion dollars a year. But essentially, I mean, I, I, you know, I also get criticized by saying that this is a nation living on charity. Yeah. This mm. is a beggar nation. Because if you're dependent on the tourists for your biggest industry, and these are predominantly, it must be said, white people coming there to sort of enjoy the sunshine and the strumming of guitars and singing, and undoubtedly a vibrant, fantastic culture. Repeat I mean, plays the Ita, of the Ita, Ita. Yeah, the Itauke culture is fantastic. You know, yeah. I mean, Itauke people Nobody are lovely people. Nobody sings better than Fijians. No, exactly. But essentially, you know, when you're dependent on the outsiders for your main e economic mainstay, that is in a sense sort of like, you know, you're not producing anything that anybody wants. You're just allowing people to come and, and have a look yeah, at you yeah, and enjoy yeah. your culture. I mean, that is a form of sort of subservience. But if you're then uh, dependent on foreign aid, and, and of course, you know, I mean, F Fiji is a massive recipient of foreign aid. Yep. Australia, New Zealand, the, the European Union is one of the biggest. And then there's yeah. homemade, the remittances we're talking about. And then the third yeah, and then the, industry and then the is, of course, the military. Well, that's right. And the military sells itself, as you know, to the, um, United, Nations. To the United Nations as peacekeepers. And of course, you know, the, the, some of this is being uh, eroded by the conduct of this government because F Fiji has deliberately taken uh, a stand at the United mm -hmm. Nations and has become one of the few countries other than the United States to give absolutely unqualified support for Israel. And yet at the same time, it has troops in the Middle East keeping the peace between the two sides there. And of course, there's a very great deal of fear and apprehension that we've just made ourselves a target in, in the Middle East. And for what? Yeah, for a yeah. fight that we don't have any skin in. And that's something that's happened under this government, um, so, so which, what are, which is what very are, unfortunate. So what are people saying you know, across the Vanua, sitting around the uh, Kava Bowl with the Bilo in hand, what are they saying to each other about where things are at? Um, yeah, as you said, fourteen. Well, or I mean, look, I do, I do, after the I, government I do has get a bit of feed. I do get a bit of feedback on this, and in, in particular from emails and, and comments that are left in the comment section of my blog. And, and at first, there was a certain fair degree of amusement about Linda Tambuya and Aseri and Drawn Draw and the sex and drug scandal in Room 233. Uh, people would joke around the Carver Bowl uh, saying, oh, bro, this is a really brutal mix. 
and everybody would, you know, would sort of erupt oh, in peals oh, of yeah. laughter. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Or, or sort of, hey, you know, I, I, I had such such a good time last night, I could barely walk today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, so that was the initial reaction, and the amusement to some extent. But since certainly since the disciplinary committee of the PAP has reported, there is a lot of anger, yeah, yeah. because people feel they've been uh, they've been deceived. I mean, on the 9th of September last year, the prime minister issued an official statement saying, "This is you know I've called these guys in. They say it's not true. I've accepted it. Therefore, move on and stop spreading the rumors." Right? So and there weren't rumors; away. they were true. Well, exactly, but you know, so everyone goes away because there was an, there's certainly a lot more respect for the national leader in these societies than than we're used to in Australia and New Zealand because you know we're advanced democracies and there's a certain amount of cynicism about and about these guys, yeah, and derision and what have you. So now that people are finding out that it's true, there's quite a lot of well shock and anger, and you only have to go to my. Um, my website, if I could just give a, a little plug, sure. uh, www.grubsheet.com.au. And if you have a look in the comments section of that, you'll see the level of shock and anger, which has erupted really, I mean, in a way that we've never seen before. That's what brings and, governments down is when people feel they've been betrayed, they've been lied yep. to by the prime minister because yep. he has, yep. uh, then you know, trust is a fleeting thing. You've either got it or you haven't. And if you haven't got it, it's very hard to win back, or if not impossible to win back once that. Well, trust that's is it. Gone. That's very yes. It's very easy to lose. And yes. this is, I mean, I you know, I've been warning that the government is losing the trust of the people, and there's two consequences of this. I mean, you know, and I do have some professional experience in in this kind of thing. There's two consequences. There'll either be a leadership challenge because people will say he wasn't able to make the hard calls that were necessary and for our political survival he has to go. Or they stumble sort of, you know, in, in a moral vacuum all the way to the next election and get decimated. And as you know, in democracies, things can change very quickly. So the fact that, and, and this is very important for New Zealanders to remember, PG First is still, you know, the former government is still the biggest bloc in the parliament, yeah? The only reason why Rambuka is prime minister is that he was able to cobble together a coalition with the National Federation Party and another pro sort of Itake party called Sadelpa. And by the power of just one vote, one vote on the floor of the parliament, he won against Bainimarama and Kayum. And yet they behave as if they've had a massive landslide. So you know? if, uh, I mean, it's unlikely that Sadelpa would entertain a coalition with Fiji first, but it, but well, no, the, not, the not National Federation can. Party could, though, couldn't it? No, not necessarily, Cam. The head of Sadelpa is the father-in-law of Aya Syed Kayum, the number two in the Bani Marama government. Yeah. So we were talking about family connections, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, I mean, people, people. You know, in politics, mate. You know, the people do what is ultimately in their own interests. Well, they're and, venal. They're venal. Yeah, they're venal. And, venal. And, and and venal is a fantastic word for it because that's exactly what it is. Yeah, they'll do anything. <laughs> they'll bloody well do anything. And you know, we've seen it repeatedly in our professional lives. I guess um, the, the yeah. I mean, exactly. But I guess the the final. Thing we've covered all these scandals. We've covered the illegal appointments. We've covered the, you know, it's it's gobsmacking, really. The the stuff that's going on in Fiji. Do you think there's a risk of another coup, or do you think the army's sitting there wondering what? Well, to do? The, you know, there was there there were a whole lot of leaked supposed intelligence reports from the uh, Royal, you know Republic of Fiji military forces over uh, many months criticising the government and saying, you know, they, they, they couldn't last. And, and so of course, that fed a whole lot of rumours of the coup. But the current RFMF commander, a guy called Major General Raw Johnny Colony Y, has ruled out a coup. And mm. he keeps saying that people should respect democracy and what have you. And he's certainly turning a blind eye to a lot of things which, which 
people would have expected him to take a stand on. And, and let me just explain this very quickly. Section 134 of the Constitution gives the Republic of Fiji military forces the duty to protect the well-being of Fiji and the Fijian people and all Fijians. That clause has, has always been interpreted as having uh, given the military the green light, if anybody's uh, rights are threatened, to intervene. Yes. Now, when the, when the government first came to power and they were doing things that people were getting upset about, Colony Y issued a public statement saying that he'd made it clear to the government that he'd expected them to respect the Constitution. Well, he's gone very quiet in recent times. And the more the coalition offends, the more silent he seems to become. And so a lot of people are very, uh, you know, upset about that. Of course, you know, as far as Australia and New Zealand are concerned, they don't want anything other than adherence to the rule of law. Yeah. And rightly so. Yeah. No, nobody yeah, yeah. wants a coup. But the point is, there is no appreciation at all on the part of the government that with a, with a majority of just one seat on the floor of the parliament, mm. that has a very limited mandate. It thinks that the one seat, but that just beating Fiji first gives it the right to do whatever it wants. Yeah. And, no, and, and this is, works. this is an, yeah. And this is another insidious thing in Fiji, and, uh, and, and it's happening in other Pacific nations as well, the winner-takes-all attitude yeah, to politics, yeah. that you get into power and you screw your opponents, you get all the perks, the flash cars, the overseas travel, all of that, and all of the power, and, and they're reduced to sort of nothing. And then, of course, they then conspire and, and fight to, to sort of you know, dislodge you, and the same thing happens all over again. And so there's none of the sort of... I suppose, what might, you know, what might be called gentlemanly acknowledgement that you've won fair and square, but I know that having won by a very slim margin, I can't sort of just do whatever I want, which, I mean, even, even somebody like you who's, who's notoriously cynical about sections of the New Zealand body politic, we can see that we're, you know, in Australia, New Zealand, things are pretty civilized in that on that basis. You know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. You know, you lose the you yeah. fight an election, you fight hard, you lost, you 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 take your licks and you go into opposition and you carry on. And New Zealand and Australia are fortunate, and we've never had you know a civil war. We haven't had any sort of insurrection or any sort of nonsense like that. We have a, a happy transfer of power or an unhappy transfer of power, but a transfer of power peacefully, nonetheless. Yeah. And I think this is the tragedy of Fiji. You know, in 1970, when, when it gained independence from Britain, it presented itself to the world as a, as a model for third world nations made up of different ethnicities and religions that, you know, the, the pursuit of the multiracial ideal and all of that. And it lasted for 17 years under Rata Sikamasesi Mara, the founding prime minister, until, you know, City of Any Rambuka came in with the guns and and began this vicious cycle of trying to assert uh, indigenous rights. And it's just a tragedy. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the Pope went to Fiji in, in 1986 saying, the, the then Pope, uh, Paul VI, saying, you know, Fiji was the, was the way the world should be, you know, a picture of sort of racial harmony and, you know, cooperation and all that kind of stuff. All that's been lost, yeah? And now again, Three decades later, we have this exodus of the country's best and brightest who've just given up on Fiji. They're leaving in droves. And, of course, it's to Australia and New Zealand's economic benefit. But what are the consequences for us strategically when these countries are weakened, you know? And, of course, that raises this horrible specter of people, you know, from outside the region who exploit things like that. And it's that is what's happening with the Chinese. Yeah? The, yeah. Chi the Chinese influence in the Pacific is, is pernicious. Yeah, it, it's Insidious it's and very, pernicious. <laughs> yeah. They're using their bucks or their wine. They're, they're buying <laughs> power and they're buying influence yeah. in ways yeah. that uh, if any other country did it, we'd, we'd be up in arms and saying, you know, this is uh, not how you conduct yourself. But the Chinese no, don't exactly. care. And they know yeah. that people won't say anything against them, so they carry on doing it. Yeah, and they don't bribe people with one, you know, or RMB. They, you know, they bribe people with US dollars. Yeah, yeah. and there's, yeah. there's plenty of stories about all of this. So they're trying to gain a strategic advantage in our region, 
it's very hard for democratic governments like Australia and New Zealand to sort of quite work out how to deal with it. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of indecision about how far to to intervene in these countries to prevent China gaining more influence. But this is a universal truth. Can yeah. if you have weak institutions, if your institutions and particularly and that you know, the criminal media. justice and, system, yeah, that includes the criminal media. justice system, yeah, the media, whatever. If you have those weak institutions and particularly in relation to the rule of law that are degraded, well, it's the beginning of the end. I mean, we've seen it in Zimbabwe, and I have said mm-hmm. before that Fiji has become the Zimbabwe of the South Seas because what happened there, as you know was that, 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 you know, Robert Mugabe at one stage was happy to play the multiracial thing and, you know, be, be friendly to white people. Then he got his war veterans so-called to move on to farms owned by, owned by uh, oh, white, you know, yeah. white people. And then, of course, there was an assault on the bureaucracy and then an assault on the judiciary so that, you know, no one could be certain of getting a fair trial. No one could be certain of of taking civil action against the government and having a judge that would do anything other than award the case to the state. All of that is starting to happen in Fiji, and it's deeply, deeply worrying. Yeah, which is why you're writing about it and why why I'm covering it on The Crunch. I think these are important stories. We shouldn't just focus on, you know, like me living in New Zealand or you living in Australia, focusing just on Australian politics. Fijian well, it's a, is, uh, far more interesting. <laughs> but, but you see, this is the thing. At one stage in the 19th century, there was this notion that it wasn't just Australia and New Zealand who were partners in the region, but Australia, New Zealand and Fiji, because, of course, Fiji was a British colony with a lot of white settlers and what have you. And there was this notion that the three countries, you know, would, would, would form some sort of, you know, association. Well, that's no longer the case. But it's still a very important uh, you know, Pacific nation in that it's strategically important, but also has a huge amount still of influence. And it's just a great shame. And of course, the importance of keeping this part of the world, you know, free from the predations of dictatorships and people who don't believe in democracy at all. Yeah. And in fact, in many instances, are gangsters. Yeah. Because the official Chinese presence in the region has been supplemented by the unofficial Chinese presence of, you know, the Chinese mafia, the triads, and yeah. they're active in all of these countries in the Pacific. And so the bad guys show signs of making significant gains, and it's to the detriment of the democracies. And, you know, we, we're seeing this all over the world, actually. The democracies have never been under so much pressure, whether it's Putin, whether it's Xi Jinping. Iran. But it's happening on our, it's, it's happening on our back door yeah, and and yet, the very you know, place you... that many Australian and uh, and New Zealanders like to go in the depths of winter for their summer holiday for, for effectively another summer holiday. That's right. But as they sip their lattes in the cafes of Auckland, Sydney, and Melbourne, you know, Wellington, you know, Christchurch or whatever, what's happening in these countries is not the topic of conversation. It hasn't yet intruded into into no. you know the, the comfy way of life of metropolitan Australians and New Zealanders, but, but you know, it is it is something that we should be worried about. And that probably is a good place to finish up this discussion, which has been fascinating yet again. Well, thanks, Cam, for having <laughs> come, Like a couple of old Kaivetis sitting there having some gin and tonics at the, at the yacht club. <laughs> I know. But I know. Anyone, like anyone some, who's some from would say we- knows that the yacht club's not that salubrious. No, I know. Some would say we're like two old women talking, you know, amongst ourselves over a cup of tea. But anyway, no, it's, it's been it's been a delight, Cam. And thanks very much, Vanaka. Yeah, Vanaka to you too. Well, that was an amazing exploration of the sordid goings on inside the Rambuka government in Fiji. Graham has always impeccable sources, and as he says, it is now all but being confirmed by an investigation from inside the People's Alliance Party. There'll be many twists and turns with this saga, though, so stay tuned, as I'm sure we'll have Graham back on the show soon enough. Let me know your thoughts about my chat with Graham Davis by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, 
just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.